to what we have done is uh, that problem still exists to some degree, but it's been reduced somewhat. So pre-Vista, mm -hmm. you basically had one giant service host process that had, I think, over 30 services inside it. Mm -hmm. So if any of them crashed, they would all crash. Uh -huh. um, what we've done in Vista is we've actually uh, expanded the number of host processes. So, mm -hmm. and and we did that for a variety of reasons. One was around reliability, so we didn't want you know one guy just crashing everybody. Um, the second one, the second reason we looked at this was around security. So, when I get through the framework that we've created here, mm -hmm. um, it'll probably become more obvious. But what we did is we looked at the groupings of services. So you have to look at services and what requirements they have and then think about should this service really be lumped in with this other service from a security perspective. So we increase the number of groups hmm. just to ensure that like-minded, if you will, services were together. Um, okay. For server, for Longhorn server, we're actually looking at further increasing the number of service host processes because Reliability is a is a bigger concern in server versus client. You know, you don't want one service taking down maybe two other services, for example. So, you could at least have the flexibility in server, and actually, you can do this in client. You can configure most of the services to run on their own, mm -hmm. but you do so at the cost of memory, essentially, and and potentially context switching. Um, okay. So that's that's some of the rationale there. So the first thing we did here is we said. Um, let's provide a mechanism for people to be able to identify their service versus being just lumped in with you know a lot of other services. So that provides some level of isolation. Um, the second thing we did is something that I call privilege stripping. So today in Windows we have uh, these things called privileges, and some of the common privileges that people are familiar with are things like the uh, the SE debug privilege mm -hmm. or the SE backup privilege, SE restore privilege. Um, by default, as I mentioned before, the local system account has all of these privileges assigned. Local service and network service also have some privileges assigned. And it turns out that in most cases, services don't need these privileges. So, for example, the debug privilege is rarely used, and that privilege can be easily misused. So if something goes wrong in a service that has the debug privilege, that service can now open pretty much any other process in the system and tamper with it. So privilege stripping, the way this works, is basically when the service is installed, um, the service defines the privileges it actually needs um, that are required for its correct functioning. And it can never really say, it, it can never go beyond what the account provides. So it can't say that, okay, give me the create token privilege, even though the account I'm running it would never hold it. So we don't allow them to elevate the privileges, the privileges they have. But we, what we do do is when the service starts we subtract out any privileges that that service doesn't need. Hmm. So um, that sounds roughly cool. analogous maybe to code access security in, in the managed code world. Mm -hmm. Instead of a manifest and say, hey, I know I'm never going to touch the registry. So Correct. just turn that Correct. off. And in fact, um, all of these constraints can be specified in a manifest, or they, at least in the Vista install framework, or they can be specified using uh, Win32 API calls when the service is installed. Um, so this is this is a way for the service author to intentionally reduce their attack service. And yes, say, I know no one should ever be using my code to mess around with a debug permission. So yep, exactly. Deny it in all cases. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, yeah, that most services require very few privileges. So by doing this, it's you know pretty cheap for somebody to look at their code, at least the author of the code, and determine, yeah, I never use these privileges. Just go ahead and take them away. Um, the third big thing that we did is uh, firewall integration. And as I mentioned before, so we've, we've provided a means to identify a service in Vista. And by doing so, we actually made it relatively straightforward to provide a means to link uh, 
firewall policy to the service. So the firewall code in Vista now essentially does the equivalent um, of an access check when a port is opened or you perform a listen. So uh, each service owner in Vista defined their firewall constraints. And in many cases, uh, we've got a number of services that never listen on the network. So those services are grouped into a specific service host or service hosts. And for those cases, the firewall will enforce, you know, you don't get to listen on any network port. The other thing we can do is we can enforce um, what ports the, the service is allowed to communicate with on an outbound basis um, with this particular feature. So that's another big thing that we did. And then a fourth one is what I'll call um, write restrictions. So what we looked at here was um, a number of services, if you look at what they're doing, again, from the developer's perspective, uh, what are the things that can go wrong, for starters? So if, let's assume for a moment that a piece of malicious software penetrates the service. What can that software do? Well, the, two of the, the vectors that we looked at were um, propagation. And of course, the firewall and integration would affect the propagation capabilities of the service or code running in the service. And then the other one is around persistence and modification of the system. So we saw that a lot of malicious code, once it got control in a service, it would write payload out you know, to some directory and then cause it to run on every boot. So we looked at, well, those are, for the most part, those dangerous operations are write-oriented in nature. So how do we really limit uh, what's allowed from a service in this particular model? So what we introduced here is something called a uh, write restricted token. And uh, services that opt into this basically have to, st they have to state what resources they normally write to. And this, again, is enabled through service identification. Basically, if you've got a service, for example, that only writes to a log file, what you have to do as the service owner is you have to make sure that the ACL on that log file grants your service specifically write access. It's no longer sufficient to just say uh, like everyone has write access, for example, or all local system services have access. Your service it has to be present specifically in the ACL. If it's not present, the write will fail. And this actually covers a broad range of resources in the system. So pretty much any time we do an access check, and that's for things like registry keys, files on the disk, opening processes, etc. If you don't, if you're not granted explicit write access, it fails. And it turns out a number of services in Vista write to very few resources, so we can enforce these specific restrictions. So those were four of the big areas that we put in place uh, for the Windows Service Hardening Framework. And like I said before, we walked through each service in Vista and applied as many of these principles as we could to every single service. And also this is fully documented for third parties. Yep. So those were the four big areas. And then there were some more subtle areas that we looked at related to services as well. Um, one is around uh, the UI interaction. So there's a, a form of attack called a shatter attack that existed prior to Vista. And in this particular situation, what would happen is somebody would install a service and they would mark the service as being um, eligible to interact with the logged on user. And there were a couple of big problems that, that came out of this. One was that in a terminal server environment, you don't really know if the service is interacting with the correct user. Because there's one instance, one instance of, the, of the service running and n number of users. Correct. Are. So. If you bring up some UI, you have no idea if you brought it up to the right user. And you're certainly not bringing it up to every user. So that's, that's one problem. The other huge problem was that this, this attack I referred to before, the shatter attack, whereby the UI comes up on the user's desktop, and now that user can send window messages to that piece of UI. And 
the code that's processing the window 